Watchmen from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. HTTP colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org. This recording is current as of August 17th, 2006. Watchmen is a 12-issue comic book written by Alan Moore and illustrated by Dave Gibbons. Originally published by DC Comics as a monthly limited series from 1986 to 1987, it was later republished as a trade paperback. It was one of the first superhero comic books to present itself as serious literature, and it also popularized the more adult-oriented graphic novel format. Watchmen is the only graphic novel to have won a Hugo Award, and is also the only graphic novel to appear in Time Magazine's list of 100 Best Novels from 1923 to the present. Watchmen is set in 1985 in an alternative history United States where costumed adventurers are real, and the country is edging closer to a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. It tells the story of the last remaining superheroes and the events surrounding the mysterious murder of one of their own. In Watchmen, superheroes are presented as real people, who must confront ethical and personal issues, who have neuroses and failings, and who are largely lacking in superpowers. Watchmen's deconstruction of the conventional superhero archetype, combined with its innovative adaptation of cinematic techniques and the heavy use of symbolism and multi-layer dialogue, have had a profound effect on later comics. Section 1. Background. Alan Moore, who wanted to transcend the perceptions of the comic book medium as something juvenile, attempted, quote, to create with Watchmen a superhero Moby Dick, something that had that sort of weight, that sort of density, unquote. Moore also named William Burroughs as one of his, quote, main influences, unquote, during the conception of Watchmen, and admired Burroughs' use of repeated symbols that would become laden with meaning in Burroughs' one and only comic strip, which appeared in the British underground magazine Cyclops. In developing Watchmen, during its embryonic stage, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons originally conceived of a story that would take, quote, familiar old-fashioned superheroes into a completely new realm, unquote. Dick Giordano, who had worked for Charlton Comics, suggested using a cast of old Charlton characters that had recently been acquired by DC, but since Moore and Gibbons wanted to do a more serious storyline in which some of the newly acquired characters would die, this was not feasible. Giordano then suggested that Moore and Gibbons simply start from scratch and create their own characters. So while certain characters in Watchmen are loosely based upon the Charlton characters, such as Dr. Manhattan, who is inspired by Captain Adam, and Rorschach, who is loosely based on the question, Moore decided to create characters that ultimately would scarcely resemble their Charlton counterparts. Originally, Moore and Gibbons only had enough plot for six issues, so they compensated, quote, by interspersing the more plot-driven issues with issues that gave a kind of biographical portrait of one of the main characters, unquote. During the process, Dave Gibbons had a great deal of autonomy in developing the visual look of Watchmen and inserted details that Moore admits he did not notice until later, as Watchmen was written to be read and fully understood after several readings. Composition. Title. The title Watchmen is derived from the phrase quis custodiet ipsos custodes from Juvenal's Satire 6 Against Women, often translated as Who Watches the Watchmen? I hear always the admonishment of my friends, bolt her in and constrain her, but who will watch the watchmen? The wife arranges accordingly and begins with them. Juvenal was credited with exposing the vice of Roman society through his expository satires, and in similar fashion, Watchman examines the trope of the costumed adventurer or superhero by examining the human flaws of its superhero characters in lieu of traditional comic book focus on its character's strengths. In Watchman, Moore shows a grittier side of the conceived notion of the superhero. The graffiti, Who Watches the Watchman, appears scrawled upon walls throughout New York City during the story, but the complete phrase is never seen. The sentence is always partially obscured or cut out of the panel. The graffiti occurs following the proposition of the Keen Act, depicting the change of public opinion towards the practice of vigilantism. This viewpoint is exemplified by the character of the second night owl who asks during an anti-vigilantism riot, quote, Who are we protecting society from? Unquote as if to illustrate the many problems with vigilantes who sometimes serve as judge, jury, and executioner, the comedian glibly replies, from themselves. Structure The graphic novel Watchmen is composed of twelve chapters. 
these chapters were originally separate issues of the comic book series, which were released sequentially in 1986. Each chapter begins with a close-up of the first panel, originally the cover to each issue. Each chapter has an epigraph from classical or pop literature, which appears in abbreviated form early on, and acts as the chapter's heading or title. The quote is given in its entirety at the end of the chapter, summarizing the events that have just occurred. Watchmen also contains many fictional primary documents, which are appended at the end of every chapter except the final one, as being a part of the Watchmen universe's media. Biographies of retired costumed adventurers, such as the retrospective Under the Hood by the retired First Night Owl, are used to help the reader understand the chronology of events and also the changes in public opinion and representation of costumed adventurers through the decades. These documents are also used to reveal personal details of the costumed adventurers' private lives, such as Rorschach's arrest record and psychiatric report. Other documents used in this way include military reports and newspaper and magazine articles. Watchmen's structure has been analyzed by many reviewers, with the Friday Review calling Watchmen a complex, multi-layered narrative populated with well-realized characters and set against a background that is simultaneously believable and unfamiliar. Perspective. When reading Watchmen, the reader often assumes the role of third-person omniscience, able to see all of the characters' actions as well as what they may be thinking, which are depicted through facial expressions and body language. Moreover, Watchmen is unconventional in that it does not rely heavily on the standard technique in the comic book genre of employing thought balloons to demonstrate its characters' thoughts although several sections comprise large episodes dedicated to the characters' thoughts. The documents that are appended to the end of each chapter, except the last, as well as media such as Rorschach's diary, help to elucidate the characters' thoughts and feelings throughout the novel, without mentioning them explicitly. The first-person perspective is also utilized, albeit more infrequently. Flashbacks are employed to help facilitate the reader's understanding of events occurring in the present, but also as a means of chronicling the differences in history between the Watchmen universe and our own. Thus, Dr. Manhattan's flashback to the Vietnam War highlights both how his and the comedian's existence altered their world's history in comparison to our own. Watchmen Observations notes that Watchmen uses a 3x3 panel structure, and there is little variation in this format. The effect is to, quote, reduce the scope for authorial voice. The reader has fewer clues how he should react to each scene. Also, they heighten the feeling of realism and distance the novel from standard action comics. Unquote. Part 3. Story. Characters. The cast of Watchmen was initially based on old Charlton Comics characters. Moore and Gibbons agreed that Watchmen required a cast of characters that had continuity and a history upon which a story could be based. DC Comics had recently acquired the rights to some old Charlton Comics characters. This prompted former DC editing manager Dick Giordano to suggest that Moore use some of these characters. However, to avoid continuity issues with the recently acquired characters, and due to the fact that some of them would have become useless for future series, Moore decided to create new characters using the recently acquired Charlton Comics characters as a template. This allowed for a more dynamic and unique set of characters. The comedian, Edward Blake, is based on Peacemaker, with elements of Marvel Comics' Nick Fury. Dr. Manhattan, John Osterman, is derived from Captain Adam, while the first and second Night Owls, Hollis Madison and Dan Dryberg, are based on Blue Beetle. Thunderbolt serves as the inspiration for Ozymandias, Adrian Veidt, and The Question and Mr. A do the same for Rorschach, Walter Kovacs. Finally, the first and second Silk Spectres, Sally Jupiter and Laurie Juspacek, are based on Nightshade, with elements of Black Canary and Phantom Lady. Although the cast of Watchmen are commonly called superheroes, the only superhuman character in the principal cast is Dr. Manhattan. The others are normal human beings with no special abilities aside from peak physical condition and access to high-class technology and weapons. In the comic, they refer to themselves as costumed adventurers. Plot Summary Spoiler Warning In October 1985, Walter Kovacs, Rorschach, investigates the murder of New Yorker Edward Blake and discovers that Blake was the comedian, a veteran costumed adventurer and government agent. Forming a theory that Blake's murder is part of a greater plot to eliminate costumed adventurers, or masks as Rorschach calls them, Kovacs warns others. John Osterman, Dr. Manhattan, 
Laurel and Jane Juspechik, second Silk Spectre, Dan Dryberg, second Night Level, and Adrian Veidt, Ozymandias. Veidt, Juspechik, and Dryberg are long retired from crime fighting, the latter two because of the 1977 passage of the Keene Act, which had banned costumed vigilantes, a law that Kovacs, deeply immersed in his Rorschach identity and moral code, ignores. Veidt had retired voluntarily in 1975, disclosing his identity publicly and using his reputation and intelligence to build a successful commercial enterprise, as well as a large personal fortune. Like Blake, Osterman remained exempt from the Keene Act as an agent of the U.S. government. He no longer engages in crime fighting, having become an important element of the ongoing Cold War. The United States and the Soviet Union have been edging towards nuclear showdown since the 1959 nuclear accident that transformed Osterman into the nuclear power Dr. Manhattan. Due to Osterman's allegiance, the U.S. has enjoyed a distinct strategic advantage, allowing it to defeat the Soviet Union in a series of proxy wars, most notably in Vietnam. This imbalance has dramatically increased global tension. In seeming anticipation of global war, American society has assumed a great sense of fatalism about the future. Signs of this in daily life range from meltdowns candy to graffiti inspired by the Hiroshima bombing to the designation of many buildings in New York as fallout shelters. Veidt, observing Osterman's increasing emotional detachment from humanity, forms a theory that military expenditures and environmental damage will lead to global catastrophe no later than the mid-1990s. As part of an elaborate plot to avert this, Veidt acts to accelerate Osterman's isolation by secretly exposing more than two dozen of Osterman's former associates to harmful radiation, inflicting a variety of cancers on them. Meanwhile, Veidt manipulates the press into speculating that Osterman himself was the cause of these cancers. Now hounded by media allegations and quarantined as a result, Osterman teleports himself to the planet Mars to contemplate the events of his life. His break with the U.S. government prompts Soviet opportunism in the form of an invasion of Afghanistan, a delayed version of the real-life event, greatly aggravating the global crisis. As the situation continues to escalate, the U.S. government and public alike realize that nuclear war would be only days away. Investigating the calamities that have befallen the other heroes, Dryberg and Kovacs discover information incriminating Veidt. Kovacs, Juspechik, Osterman, and Dryberg confront Veidt at his Antarctic retreat, but too late to prevent the final phase of his plan. Using a teleportation device, Veidt moves a massive, genetically engineered psionic creature into the heart of New York City, knowing that the teleportation process would kill it. In its death throes, the creature releases a psychic shockwave containing imagery designed to be so violent and alien as to kill half the residents of the city and drive many survivors insane. With the world convinced that the creature is the first of a potential alien invasion force, the United States and the Soviet Union withdraw from the brink of war and form an accord to face this apparent extraterrestrial threat. The murderer of Blake is revealed to be Veidt himself, acting after Blake had accidentally discovered the details of Veidt's plot. Veidt also eliminated numerous employees and minions. At the end, the only people aware of the truth are Veidt, Dryberg, Juspechik, Kovacs, and Osterman. Dryberg, Juspechik, and Osterman agree to keep silent out of concern that revealing the plot could reignite U.S.-Soviet tensions, but Kovacs refuses to comp compromise and is killed by Osterman. The ending is deliberately ambiguous about the long-term success of Veidt's plan to lead the world to utopia. After killing Kovacs, Osterman talks briefly with Veidt, professing his guilt and doubt. Veidt asked the omniscient Osterman for closure. I did the right thing, didn't I? It all worked out in the end. Osterman, standing within Veidt's orrery, replies cryptically, In the end, nothing ends, Adrian. Nothing ever ends. He then disappears, leaving Earth forever. His departure, leaving the solar system model in the orrery, framed by a residue appearing distinctly similar to an atomic mushroom cloud. However, before confronting Veidt, Kovacs had mailed his journal detailing his suspicions to the New Frontiersman, a far-right-wing magazine Kovacs frequently read. The final frame of the series shows a new Frontiersman editor contemplating which item from the crank file to which Kovacs' journal has been consigned to use as filler for the upcoming issue. Tales of the Black Freighter Tales of the Black Freighter is a comic book within the Watchmen universe. The specific issues shown in Watchmen chronicle Castaway's attempts to return home to warn his family of the arrival of the Black Freighter, a phantom pirate ship which houses the souls of the dead. As the man's journey progresses, he becomes more and more unscrupulous, attempting to justify his increasingly irrational paranoid disposition and his criminal acts. A pirate comic book was conceived by Moore because he and Gibbons thought that since the inhabitants of the Watchmen universe experience superheroes in real life, 
then, quote, they probably wouldn't be at all interested in superhero comics. A pirate theme was suggested by Gibbons and Moore agreed because he is, quote, a big Brecht fan. The comic is being read by a teenage boy whilst he sits beside a newsstand, whose proprietor, meanwhile, contemplates the latest news headlines and discusses them with customers. This juxtaposition of text and images from the story within a story and its framing sequence use the former to act as a parallel commentary to the latter, which is the plot of Watchmen itself. Specifically, Moore has said that the story of the Black Freighter ends up describing, quote, the story of Adrian Veidt. In addition, the comic can also be seen to, quote, relate to Rorschach and his capture, it relates to the self-marooning of Dr. Manhattan on Mars. It can be used as a counterpoint to all these different parts of the story, unquote. Moore also intended the opening panel in Chapter 3 to reinforce the reader's identification with the radioactive warning trefoil. Moore thought that the close-up of the trefoil in the first panel looked like a stylized picture of a black ship. The trefoil then came to represent, quote, a black ship against a yellow sky. In spoilers.